I was inspired to write The Look of the Past because I wanted to work out for myself what it means to use visual and material evidence as a historian. And so I try to spell out quite explicitly what I think the issues are and to take people through the arguments that one might make. I was also inspired to try and put into the book examples of how you do it. So in the book, there are four essays which are about specific things. And I love working with specific objects and images. And I really wanted to, I suppose, partly give myself the challenge of seeing if I could do this, if I could write the essays, if I could link that with the arguments that you have to make to make the use of these kinds of sources as convincing as possible. The biggest benefits in using visual material in studying history, to my mind, are what I would call achieving integrative history. So we could say people in the past didn't have their world neatly divided up into the word bit of their experience, the visual bit of their experience and so on. They experienced the world as an integrated whole. Their visual experience is a major component of that. Why would we separate it out? Why would we neglect it? So it's about a more holistic and integrative approach to history. I think there are some challenges in using visual materials for historians. One of them is that you have to engage with a number of other disciplines. So you have to engage with art history, if you're interested in the modern world, perhaps with the history of film and um, modern media. I don't particularly emphasize that in the book because I felt that it already covered enough. So I don't talk about film, TV and radio, but a lot of these arguments apply to modern media. So I think you have to be open to other disciplines, including the technical aspects of other disciplines. And this relates to another challenge of using visual and material culture for historians, which is understanding some of the nuts and bolts, if you like, of how things are made. I think a, a, another challenge of using visual materials is that a lot of them, of course, are associated with art. And we think of art as a rather special kind of human endeavour. And I think sometimes people are a little in awe of those materials. So they can't see perhaps quite how you could use a Picasso painting to talk about the nature of culture and society in the early 20th century. And I hope that the book gives some ideas about how even the most prestigious and fabulous forms of art are nonetheless and necessarily historical. In studying visual and material culture, you have to take account of changes between periods. So I think that how we approach visual and material culture according to period is a really important question. And there are a number of ways that one can think about this. One is in terms of simply what kinds of techniques and materials were available. So. Photography, for example, has a very particular history. Photography is publicly announced in 1839. And we can track responses to this. Now, it didn't come out of nowhere. But the fact is, this is very much a story about the 19th century, 19th century modes of understanding. So period is absolutely fundamental. The other way in which it's important is in terms of audiences and the capacity to buy, to use, to sell, to see. So these change markedly from one period to another. My book covers the period from 1600 onwards. And when I say covers, what I mean is that it draws examples from 1600 onwards. And there's a very important reason for this. Historians who work on earlier periods tend to be much more attentive to visual and material evidence because in general they have much less evidence. Uh, 
I would like readers to take from the look of the past a sense of my enthusiasm for using such sources. I'd also like them to take a respect for the sources, by which I mean an ability to engage with them deeply on their own terms. They're not lesser documents, they're something in their own right. I'd like them to perceive the richness of these sources and their capacity to bear testimony to past phenomena. I'd like readers to get from the book a clear sense of how you make arguments as a historian using visual and material evidence. I hope that students will like the lively examples. I've really tried to choose a wide range of instances where issues about visual and material evidence comes up. So hats, coins, um, drawings, photograph albums, postcards and so on. And I hope they'll find that interesting, lively, entertaining, even fun. But I hope they will like what I have most sought for, which is a clarity of argument about the nature of historical practice. And I hope that they will appreciate that and be able to see the arguments and the examples as fitting convincingly together. Writing the look of the past has been for me the culmination of many years, even many decades, of thinking about how to use visual and material evidence. So when I was quite a young historian, someone suggested to me that I look at wax anatomical models. That was in the 1970s. And in various ways, I've been trying to explore these questions or the, the questions that are raised by using that kind of evidence ever since. And that, for me, was a very important motivation for writing the book, to try and make sense of something that has been part of my research and writing for a long, long time. I don't think I'd have written it in this form had I not had the experience of writing another book, History and Practice, which is about the historical discipline more generally. And I partly felt emboldened to try something like the look of the past because of having done two editions of that book. So I am now still constantly thinking about how we do this kind of historical work. So I regard the look of the past as my first attempt even if it's a culmination, it's just my first attempt to try and make sense of some of these bigger issues. So how it fits into my work is that it's part of a desire both to immerse myself in specific materials, but also to be constantly stepping back and saying, mm, how do we do this? Why do we do this? What do we learn? How are we engaged? And I don't think really those are two entirely different things, but I think they have a different level of focus, if you like. One is much more intense and immersed and the other is more distance, but each without the other would be inadequate. It's no good just saying, gosh, we've got all these wonderful visual material sources, let's sink ourselves into them. That's no good. And it's no good just speaking at a generic level about how we do history. We have to try and build in, I think, to what we do, different levels of argument. In writing the book, I couldn't have done it without the support of a wide range of, of institutions that are really outside no, the normal university environment, and particularly the kind of archives and, and records that museums have, but also the kinds of collections that museums have, so that historians can go to museums and just nurture their visual fields, their visual experience of the periods that they study. And to do that, we need to be in close alliance with museums. And I think that is increasingly recognised. And I very much hope that my book will be 
if a very small, but at least a small co contribution to that recognition that m the museum world and the university world are fundamentally linked and that our history will become richer and richer as we work more and more closely with museums.